Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll visit the Hopperstadt Stav Church at the Yumkump Center in Moorhead, Minnesota. But first, joining me now is Mark Watney, the North Dakota Farmers Union President. Mark, thanks for joining us well, thank today. Thank for the opportunity, I appreciate it. Well, as we get started, tell the folks a little bit about yourself, maybe your background. Well, I am a farmer. Uh, to be elected president of North Dakota Farmers Union, you need to be a farmer. Uh, my farm is near Belva, North Dakota, which is north central North Dakota. And uh, we grow a variety of crops from corn, beans, to wheat, to canola. And I'm fortunate to have a, a, a very wonderful brother that takes care of my operation when I'm doing the Farmers Union duties. Okay. So uh, with that said, what, you know, as the president, I mean, uh, what does that mean? Well, I work for a educational organization and an advocacy organization. So Farmers Union is a grassroots where we really go after the membership's input to determine what policies we support and what programs we develop. So we're focused on, obviously, uh, the advocacy work to try to enhance farm income. Uh, we do education. We believe in cooperation. And then, of course, we have a legislative arm that works to try to enhance the income for family farms and their rural communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you hear a lot about tariffs and things like that, but what impact have, have the tariffs had, and maybe you can explain it a little bit, but have they had really on, on the farmers in this region? Well, it, it's really a trying time. Um, we're having one of these years where multiple issues are coming at agriculture, but the, the probably the hugest one is the tariffs. So if, if people think about uh, trading, a lot of people use this terminology of free trade. It's somewhat of a myth. Uh, we, we really never arrive at free trade. Uh, we should really be working towards a fair trade system. Well, the tariffs came as there was interpretation by the administration that there was things that weren't fair with the trade with China, not specifically related to agriculture, but to other things. And of course, China's re way to respond to that was to put pressure on another sector of our economy, which is agriculture, by putting tariffs on some of our imported products. Um, they're a huge importer of soybeans and other products, and, and this has just really burdened us with excess supply and taken our market prices down. Mm -hmm. Now, so uh, North Dakota Farmers Union president, that, uh, do you represent all farmers of North Dakota? Well, you know, there obviously there's other farm organizations and commodity groups, but we have almost 50,000 members. Of them, roughly 20,000 are farmers. And it's a family membership, so we do represent a, a huge portion of North Dakota. Uh, those farmers come to our convention, which is actually this week, and uh, go through our policy, and they help us write what we're going to represent each year and what we're going to fight for. Yeah, well, with that said, when you say represent, so what is your group doing? Uh, when, I assume you go to Washington or talk with the, the delegation uh, to make your voice heard and on, on different issues. Well, we, we started, uh, obviously, um, with farm programs. As we focus on them, we try to enhance that safety net. Um, we're not real happy with the farm program not having the level of safety net necessary so we don't have to do ad hoc disasters. So now when a, a trade scenario or a weather pattern or something comes along that uh, makes it tough for us, then we go in and try to find those sources of money to help offset uh, that climate that people live in with the agriculture. So we started uh, um, early on when uh, President Trump came to the state, we actually did a rally. Uh, not in opposition of his administration, but in opposition of this potential trade war, uh, knowing that it was going to be something that would last probably longer than we had planned, and the impact will be felt for years after it's hopefully resolved. So uh, we're out there working for uh, keeping farmers whole, as they promised. Uh, we tell the Senate primarily, we work a lot with Senator Hoven, uh, trying to get them to appropriate the dollars necessary to offset this uh, kind of a economic impact that's out of the control of the farmer's hands. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> whether it's uh, tariffs or, or any, anything that goes on, I assume you're working as much as you can with the delegation. How much does the farm bill uh, affect uh, the farmers out there? Well, if you, if you look over time, um, typically the, the income on the farm is almost always the profit side comes from the government. So we make a certain portion out of the marketplace, but due to the fact that we have uh, extremely good producing farmers, we overproduce the market. So what we sell into that place is generally at a lower price, and, and that's a good thing. Uh, we're providing an excess amount of food that keeps food costs down for the consumer, 
but it takes some supplemental income from a farm program. Uh, the challenge with the farm program is we're writing it on budget. And uh, when we do that in a declining amount available for agriculture, that safety net that steps in when the prices are low becomes ineffective. And then we go back to these ad hoc disaster programs. Yeah. Well, maybe let's talk about this year. What impact uh, did the early snowfall have on farmers this year? Well, it was really an interesting year. So we were harvesting a lot of the small grains and uh, maybe a little bit of the uh, canola, the early oil seeds. And we were about two thirds done with that when we got uh, the wet weather, start, weather started in early September. And then of course we had to have that early October snowstorm. So it left uh, crops out there that you wouldn't even expect. Now, not huge quantities, but there's still wheat and canola up in the north, northern part of the state that will probably never be harvested. Uh, well, that, there you go, because that's what I was going to ask. What parts of the state were hit the hardest by the storm? And so there are crops that will not be harvested at all? There is. So uh, obviously we uh, got a break after the snowstorm, so a lot of the soybeans were able to get off. Uh, but no, there's wheat, there's canola. I've even heard of a few barley fields. And then, of course, uh, here in the valley, you have sugar beets and potatoes um, that aren't harvested. Now, wheat, canola, that's a small percentage. Potatoes and sugar beets, we're looking at somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. And the soybeans, uh, we probably left 10 percent in the field because we couldn't get it due to the wet and the snow. Uh, but we got the, the majority. But corn is still sitting out there. You, you, I just drove in and there's corn fields everywhere. Um, I'm told there's almost 60 percent of the corn out in the field yet. But that would be harvested probably, or well, most it, of it. It or? may be, but this cold, wet year, we're looking at a very, very light test weight. So uh, the guys calling me were looking at somewhere between 48 and 50, 51 pounds. Uh, the question is, is there a market for it? Uh, right now, nobody's willing to buy that stuff under 50 pounds. So will that change in the future? Um, will it dry down so that they don't have terrible costs? What's crop insurance gonna do? So. Uh, I think it'll be harvested, but there's a chance that some of that might be left and not harvested also. Hmm. You know, people often talk to me about uh, uh, people taking chances and gamblers. I think farmers are some of the biggest gamblers in the world, it seems like. <laughs> well, they are, you know, and what you, just like a, a gambler would do, you try to minimize your risk by knowing as much as you possibly can. And, and I really am proud of farmers. I mean, they, they do a really great job, and, and ranchers. They really know their stuff. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think, there's people out here that aren't doing the job well. Don't they do it well, and, and we do. We provide a food security system that's second to none. And, and I think sometimes the consumer forgets that when they look at the costs uh, sometimes we have to do to support the agriculture system. Well, you know, back up to spring even. I mean, it seemed like maybe a late spring. Did things look good during the spring planning, or were, was it tough then? It was really tough then. Uh, we were sitting on excess moisture, excess rain, and that's really why the corn is uh, not up in test weight is because it didn't get enough time to mature as we plant it a little bit later than normal. And then again, you get the cool weather so you, you don't get the growing days or the sun that you need and the plant doesn't finish, that's where these low test weights come from. Yeah, again, weather uh, you can't predict, can't control, but do we seem to be in a wet cycle right now? Well, I think there is areas that are a wet cycle. Uh, the northern part of the state actually was a little dry to start with. They got the crop in relatively early and turned wet later. Uh, but there's pockets here, uh, large areas that are just excess moisture, uh, uh, probably south of I-94 to east of 83, down into South Dakota. There's some terrible wet area and a lot of preventive plant. And that, that's, that's gonna be hard to deal with because that moisture doesn't leave over the winter. So we'll have some issues next spring. Yeah, you, you mentioned some of the uh, hardest hit uh, crops inter by interrupted harvest and by tariffs. But, you know, how has it, ch it changed over the years? It seems like uh, there's just a wide variety of, of crops in North Dakota with the potatoes, sugar beets, corn, soybeans. Well, and that's one of the keys. You know, we grow 33 crops. We lead the country and I believe 11. It changes every once in a while. But uh, we are trying to diversify into those crops that make more money. Uh, but if you really watch the markets, and if you, uh, you know, go to the Chicago Board of Trade and watch number two yellow corn and watch soybeans, they tend to set the direction of all crops. So uh, when we see, um, you know, people say, well, why don't you just grow something different? Or are these other crops impacted because of the trade if they're not exported? And really they are. I mean, we, if, if somebody wants you to grow edible beans, they simply price it just above what they do to get you to switch from soybeans to edible beans. So if soybeans are low, they can charge less. So we have a problem where our commodities are underpriced, um, our purchasing power is dwindling, 
and the value of what we get per bushel is getting extremely low. So it's, it's, it's definitely a challenge to be in agriculture today. Mm -hmm. Have we seen any type of aid or will, will we see some kind of disaster relief for we, farmers? We did with the, what they call the market facilitation payment. And it, it's, it's something that farmers would prefer not to get in that light, but it has helped. It's, it's not near the level we need to make up what may have been, uh, but it's helped. Um, there's another program for the weather that's out there that we're a little unsure how it's going to work called WIP Plus. Uh, it's a limited amount of dollars, but it seems like that's going to have some potential for the guys that were impacted by this uh, winter storm and the wet weather this fall. Mm -hmm. uh do you expect some farmers would, might go out of business because of a year like this? You know, we're already seeing a few. Um, we're seeing some bankruptcy rates up, uh, uh, not so much here right in North Dakota, but in our area, South Dakota's had quite a few. Um, that really will start to show up. Um, hotlines are being called. Uh, sadly, there's even been some suicides, so it's a, it's a sad scenario. Um, I take some way more interesting calls on people calling with the challenge they're facing. Um, you know, it's hard to measure what's uh, a lot of calls and what's not a lot of calls, but the call numbers into our office asking us to help are up quite a bit because people are very concerned if they can survive this economically. You know, I know there, there are some organic farmers, startups and whatever, but it, w can you even start up farming nowadays? It seems like farms have become big, bigger business for people. Yeah, it, it, it really has. And, and of course, that really varies on the type of farm you are. But in North Dakota, we're looking at probably an 1,800 acre average farm when you look at the grain side of things. And, and to get the capital together and the necessary mm -hmm. machinery, uh, you almost need a relative or a dad or a mom or a family or somebody uh, to help you get that initial start. Um, some people find it in specialties. Um, organics, again, I, I think if you were near a, a community where there's a high population, you'd have some more options. Um, organic wheat, for example, does get a premium, but it's a uh, it, it can be overproduced too to a point where that premium goes down and of course it's uh, especially expensive to get started there because you have to take some yield losses till you get your ground to function the way it needs to for organic. So there's opportunity but it's, it's certainly challenging as uh, again, you're purchasing power, that's what everyone mm -hmm. forgets. Uh, what you get paid today for your, and what you, and what you could purchase before to a today is so much less that it's really hard to get started in agriculture. Yeah, and with that, you mentioned crop, crop prices a little bit. What are they currently, and, and I mean, do they fluctuate a lot just on any given quarter or, or year? Well, they're down. I mean, I would say, um, you know, generally they're probably about 30, 40 percent below what we need for cost of production. Um, so they do fluctuate, but they don't move as much as people think. Um, they, they may in a, over a, a larger window of time, but uh, farmers need money, so you don't always get the luxury of holding that grain or waiting for a higher price, and, and then you take some risk, it may go down. Um, there are some tools that work, uh, but at the end of the day, a farmer has to deliver on those contracts, has to deliver on a hedge. Um, you know, you, you gotta be prepared to uh, make sure that you live up to the expectations whether you do it through the futures market or not. So it, it takes a lot brighter person, in a sense, of the markets to be able to make, take advantage of some of the things uh, but it's really tough. And then, of course, when you get in a scenario where you don't have production, that really makes it messy, too. Sure. Uh, farm bill. How important is that to a farmer, and, and when, when's the next one going to come up? Well, the next one will probably start to be discussed uh, late next year. Um, obviously, they typically run past the, the time that they are necessary to develop. Um, we're really operating on the one that was written in 2018, so we only have two years in a five-year but it's so important. Uh, in most cases, it ends up being about 30% of the farm income. So we, we need the farm bill, we need the crop insurance programs. We actually need them to be quite a bit stronger with more money to make it really function if we're gonna be in this overproduction scenario that benefits the consumer and provides that food security. Yeah, and when you look at North Dakota, because uh, that's where you concentrate, obviously, but is it very similar for other states or is the Midwest different than, say, the South? or? It, it, it's fairly similar. I mean, you know, corn is growing pretty much across the country. Uh, cotton plays down, obviously, in the south. Um, you have wheat all over the place and a lot of the oil seeds and soybeans. So when you talk about some of the, you know, what I call the eight major commodities, they all need a farm program. Um, and again, that's because we're just so wonderful at production. And uh, I, I really hate to uh, suggest that farmers don't understand what they're doing in a sense of why don't they produce and make money, but it's really about us being good at production. 
and uh, until we understand that we have to match supply and demand, we'll need farm programs or we're going to struggle with a pricing scenario. Well, I assume the farmer would chase the highest price he thought he could get for what crop, but you can't always do Everybody can't grow soybeans if they're at the high, exactly, high price. Exactly, exactly. And then we kill the markets right away if everybody goes. And, and you know, I, if, if you and I are both farmers and we live 50 miles apart, and if you think I might not see something, you might see it, or both of us are chasing the, the same high price. And, and uh, again, it's a good thing for a nation to have food. You know, food's pretty essential. Next to air and water, it's the next thing. So I, I find it a food security system. So I really think the Farm Bill is more about having that excess production. Um, I don't think the consumer would love a just-in-time delivery system of food. I think they'd find that to be terribly expensive. Mm. Do you think the tariff story has, has been told enough and that people in, in maybe non-agriculture areas uh, have enough information on that? I, I think it's been talked about a lot, but I think there's both good information and poor information on it. Uh, a lot of people were assuming there was tariffs on agriculture before the trade war started, which there wasn't. Uh, a lot of people don't understand that. And, and they don't really understand the need we have to move a lot of product. Uh, we, we just produce a lot of soybeans. That's the primary one. And, and when you hold uh, 20, 30 percent of that back into the domestic market, it just kills the, kills the market. Um, so we, we need these. We need places for these products to go and uh, we need help when the prices are this low or we're gonna concentrate farming into the hands of very few. And then I say they'll probably figure supply-sided economics out, which uh, may not be in the interest of the, of the consumer. Well, with that said, and we've talked a lot around it a lot, and so what impact has all this had on, uh, you know, on North Dakota farming? Well, we've lived with two, three years of uh, prices probably lower than they would have had to been. Um, when you get in a time where you have weather conditions, usually, you'll see a price movement that helps you through that weather because you get paid a little bit more for less production. Um, so that's been the, the hard part uh, is we're living with lower prices. The second side of this is, is that this is going to stay a long time. We, we've built up burdensome stocks worldwide now and that, that's going to hurt us as we go forward because it'll take time for them to work their way through the system so we can get a better representation of what we're producing for price. Yeah, and then how does that impact North Dakota's economy? Well. You know, it, it's, it's a little bit of an argument over what that turnaround dollar is, but my understanding is, a, you know, a dollar coming from a farm here, which is, is, is new money, uh, turns at least three and a half, somewhere up to uh, six times, and that much less dollars being available is that much less to turn in the economy. Hmm. Well, what, crystal ball, are you optimistic about next year or, or not? Well, <laughs> a farmer is always optimistic, and, and, and there's things we can do. Uh, I sometimes get frustrated more with the fact that people don't think we have control of our destiny in agriculture, and we do. We can choose to do things in food production. So I'm going to work my best in the farm organization to try to enhance it, and farmers are going to do their best at production. So you have to be optimistic or it'd be hard to be a farmer. Sure, it would. Well, we're out of time, so if people want more information, where can they go? The www.ndfu.org is our website, and there's usually a lot of information on there that you can either link to or is on our website. Okay. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Stay tuned for more. The Hopperstad Stav Church is an impressive structure combining centuries-old wooden church architecture from Norway with modern building techniques. Designed by Guy Paulson during his retirement years, this magnificent structure stands on the grounds of the Yumkamp Center in Moorhead, Minnesota, and has become a must-see destination for people around the world. I like the smell of pine. And I satisfied that we got it started and we got it finished and it's still standing and people seem to enjoy coming here. So there's a lot of satisfaction in that. Guy Paulson in the mid 1990s was nearing retirement age or, and, and uh, he wanted a retirement project, I think. <laughs> Style of churches are really fascinating pieces of architecture. Around the year 1000, the Vikings convert to Christianity. The Scandinavians, the Norse culture, give up Odin, Thor, Loki, their old gods, and they have to build churches for this new religion they joined up with. Everywhere else at this time in Europe, it was the age of the giant stone cathedrals being built up to the sky. 
In Scandinavia, this was a culture of carpenters, they're woodworkers. So these are wooden translations of medieval stone cathedrals. These are called stav churches or stave churches because of the construction technique. The word stav, S-T-A-V, in Scandinavian languages means an, a vertical piece of wood, an up and down piece of wood. The scary Scandinavian barbarians become Europeans. And we're watching that happen in a building right here. So it, even though this doesn't look like any building we've ever been in before, maybe it looks more like Lord of the Rings or something. It's still a medieval basilica church. It's got the nave where the people stand and they, everybody stood for church back then. You take a step up to the altar where the altar is, that's the chancel. It's got a row of windows called the clear story. This is the recipe to make a medieval church. It's just made out of wood. The idea came several, many years before I retired. In fact, sort of drove my wife nuts because I wouldn't drop it. But about 10 years or so before that, and you ask, why did I get interested? Well, there's a variety of reasons. Number one, my father was probably most instrumental. He was born in Norway, about uh, 100 kilometers or so north and east of the Hofstede Church in a place called Jostedal. And I started reading books about Stav churches, and the idea didn't go away, so I figured the time had come to retire and do something. I retired in 95, and most of 96 was working with architects, getting plans from the Norwegians, and deciding how we were going to go about it. Actual building on site, I started carving for all the parts that had to be incorporated as we build it. I started that in about January of 97, and then I worked steady on that all through 97, and then in the summer of 97, they started building on site and then the basic structure was built and completed in about June of 98. And that's when the dedication was. So it was about five and a half, six years from beginning to end. On the inside, in the nave where the people are, there's a beautifully carved baldachin. Baldachins are kind of canopies over altars. There's four heads carved on it. We have Jesus on top. Uh, the, probably the king and queen of Norway uh, below that. And the fourth person, we don't know who he is, but we know he's a monk from his haircut. The paintings tell the Christmas story. And the chancel where the priest would stand is the leper's window. If you're sick, you're not allowed inside to get everybody else sick but you don't want to stay home from church because if you're about to die of the plague, you want those sins checked off your record before you go. So you come to get your communion through the drive through window. Outside, you'll see a lot of dragons mixed in with the Christian crosses. And you know, if you tell a Viking to put a gargoyle on top of their church, they put the dragon off the prow of a Viking ship. So they have very Viking gargoyles on the outside. The front door carvings took Guy Paulson about a year to carve. Putting the church here, adding it to the Emkamp's Viking ship has really made this an international destination for Norwegian American heritage. We are a little county historical society in Northwest Minnesota, but we're more than that now. We have busloads of Norwegians coming here. Just last week, there was a busload of Norwegians that I toured through this. We have so many Norwegians coming in that we have our films subtitled in Norwegian for them. We've had quite a few visitors here from Norway. There was one family that came here and their daughter was married here. And they were very complimentary as Norwegians usually are. I think they appreciate it. It is what it is. We did what we did, and we were happy with it. Had a lot of fun building it. If they didn't enjoy it, I wouldn't be happy about it. But they say they are. <laughs> I survived the deal, and it worked out. Yeah, it worked out really well. Craftsmanship isn't dead. I don't get tired of being in this building. I, I, I look at these, uh, I, I look at how it's put together. I'm a woodcarver myself, a woodworker myself, and so it's really an inspiration to me. 
Mr. Paulson is an inspiration. It's American ingenuity. Machines can't do better than a guy with a chisel and a mallet who knows how to use it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.